Hello and welcome back to Archetype Builds. This is a channel where we tell you all about a paragon, usually a stereotype, an archetype from fantasy or fiction, and we tell you how to build it for your Dungeons and Dragons character. Today we are taking a look at a build in the 1D&D rules. This is a 1D&D character build for you to play as the Viking. The Viking is the battle-scarred rager of the Nordic Seas. They are accustomed to extremely cold weather, surprise attacks on villages, and of course, their signature maneuver, the thing that they are known for across the world, is the Berserker. So we are going to be building a Berserker Barbarian in 1D&D um, to make it fit the Viking kind of archetype. I had originally scripted this video for 5e, and I just felt awful about it. I kept kicking the can down the road because I knew the Berserker Barbarian in 5e is a trap subclass, and if you've seen my Barbarian ranking series, you'll know that it's one of the worst subclasses in the entire game, but there's no other one that I could, you know, reasonably recommend to be that, like, Viking Berserker. So I was... I was stuck for a long time until the D&D 5 playtest packet came out. Even then, I wanted to hold off and see what kind of stuff was changing, but as you might have seen in one of my uh, more recent, you know, what's going on with 1D&E videos, I think a lot of the changes that have been proposed so far are going to remain and going to remain stable. So, I feel comfortable bringing to you the 1D&D &D Viking build. So to start off with, while I have often used races for their um, you know, racial stat bonuses, I can say with absolute confidence that we are going to be able to have floating stats in the 1D&D rule system. So we actually don't need to worry that much about who gets what in particular. However, I do need a species to draw from, and uh, looking at some of the more recent books to prioritize over some of the older ones, I have a couple options. Obviously, the Goliath gives the best visual representation of the Viking. Vikings were often tattooed all over their body. I do have to say that uh, the Viking image has inspired the Goliath, you know, art style and, and all of the kind of like components that go into the Goliath. However, Goliaths are specifically like mountain people, like up in the high, like rocky slopes, whereas Vikings sail the seas and rarely venture too far inland. I really want a species that is going to kind of hammer home the idea of being comfortable on the ocean, of being a seafaring people. I considered the Triton, but because of some things that we're going to talk about later, there was significant overlap with some of the class features that we were going to be looking at as part of our multi-class. Then I stumbled across the Mordenkheims Presents Monsters of the Multiverse Sea Elf, which has everything that I want, including cold resistance. So now we can be naked in the cold, you know, winter of the of the Nordic climates, and we will be inured against some of the worst effects of that cold damage, which I think is absolutely perfect. We've got some strong connection with the with the sea and the ocean here, including the ability to swim if need be. I think we are all set for our sea elf race to be our Viking stand-in. And then of course we are going to start Barbarian. We are going to be going Barbarian for the first six levels. That is actually a pretty standard progression. There's no spell selection in Barbarian. Um, there's no invocation selection. There's no you know, fighting styles. Uh, so it's going to be a pretty straightforward shot. But here at level one, we do need to talk a little bit about weapons because in 1D&D, &D, weapons have weapon mastery properties and we as Barbarian are going to get to unlock some of those properties. So let's talk about weapons. Vikings in the real world used all kinds of weapons. Um, they primarily used long swords, but they were often known to use um, these kind of short or hand axes. Um, they used shields, they used halberds, they used all uh, bows and arrows. Uh, they were a, you know, for the time, modern fighting force, and they didn't, you know, restrict themselves to any one weapon group. I do think that the modern conception of the barbarian is strongly rooted in axes. Um, particularly, I think that the stereotype is the two hand axes 
for a Berserker Barbarian, which I want to be able to recommend, but I simply cannot. Even with the changes in 1 D&D to 2 weapon fighting, um, I just don't think this is the best use for Barbarians like powerful muscles. And given that the real historical Barbarians used all kinds of weapons, I'm going to give us a little bit of leeway here to uh, choose the weapon that works the best mechanically, rather than the one that's the most Viking. If you want to see two axe-wielding Viking build, I will go ahead and put a level 10 character sheet up for that build on my Patreon that you can subscribe to for $1, get access to all the character sheets for all the builds that I do. So, uh, I am going to take our little leeway with weapons to um, focus in on some pole arms. Uh, I think that it's going to be important to keep uh, the following pole arms on our person. Um, we are definitely going to need the glaive. Uh, the glaive with the heavy um, and reach property uh, is going to have the graze mechanic unlocked, which means even when we miss, we're going to do a little bit of damage, which is important if we're doing a lot of attacks. The other thing we're going to want to grab is the pike, uh, and the pike, we're going to unlock the push weapon mastery on that so that we can push enemies away. It's going to be an important part of our strategy later on. I do, of course, recommend that you keep some, some hand axes, some long swords, you know, a shield, whatever, in your inventory. As a barbarian, you don't have a lot that you're spending gold on. So yeah, stock up on some of the, the tools of the trade, keep them in your pack. Uh, and if you need to be versatile, you can be versatile. That's going to, I'm going to recommend that we draw on. At level 1 as well, we are of course getting our Rage, which is new and improved in the 1 D&D system, so now we can maintain our Rage with a bonus action if we need to, or we can make an attack or get hit as usual. We are also getting our Unarmored Defense, which is why we don't need to wear armor. You can uh, have a shield, I have us using two-handed weapons for the most part, um, but that is an option, something that Vikings did as well. At second level, we're getting Primal Knowledge. Primal Knowledge is going to allow us to use our Rage outside of combat in order to add our Strength bonus to certain checks. The place where I think this is going to be most helpful is um, specifically with regards to survival checks. A lot of times your DM is going to ask for a survival check in order to pilot naval you know, vessels. That's, that's most commonly the check associated with steering ships and stuff like that. If you are in a position where your character is fitting the campaign, there's some naval components going on, you are on the ship and need to do something with it, and need to make a survival check, very good chance that you're going to want to be able to rage in order to add your strength modifier to that survival check to make it much better. Second level, we're also getting Reckless Attack, which is of course something we want to be doing all of the time, and going to severely like increase the, uh, the damage that we are going to be dealing. This, of course, means that our Graze weapon is going to be much less helpful because we are hitting much more often with constant advantage. You can maybe stow that weapon um, and use a different one, using that push weapon to push people away from you. Because you have a pull arm, if you hit them and push them five feet away, you can still hit them without moving from your current position because they are within reach. Uh, maybe even pushing them outside of your reach, which is what would be ideal. So that's what I want to recommend is you're using a is you're using your pike for the most part on this build. At third level we're getting our barbarian subclass and we are of course going with the berserker. The berserker is going to give us the access to frenzy which is kind of an upgraded rage and during our upgraded rage once per turn when we hit someone with an attack, we are going to get to add a number of d6s equal to our rage modifier, which is going to be a 2 for most of our career, but at ninth level jumps up to a 3, um, and then I'm not... it's going to be a 3. So an extra 2d6 per turn, and then 3d6 at later levels. It's not the craziest boost to damage, but we can consistently get this, um, especially as we start looking into, like, getting multi-attack, getting bonus action attacks, getting reaction attacks, we are often going to be able to land at least one hit on our enemies and do some extra damage based on that. At fourth level, we are going to pick up a feat, even though we need so many uh, ability score increases on this character. This was a feat I thought worked so well with everything else we were doing, and that is the Polar Master feat. In 1 D&D, they did change the Polar Master, but not by that much. The important components are all still there, including 
if we make an attack with a heavy reach weapon, which we have, we're, we've got our pike, we can make a bonus action attack with the butt end of the weapon. So we're going to get an additional attack per turn. And remember, you only need your bonus action to maintain your rage if you don't take the attack action, which is the prerequisite for using that butt action attack. So we are all good on maintaining rage and having these two features play well together to consistently make use of our bonus action. And it's going to allow us to deal another reckless attack, which we love, very high chance of hit. And if we have you know, missed twice with our polearm, we get that third chance to land the frenzy damage bonus, right? It's also going to benefit from our normal rage bonus to damage and our, um, you know, our strength modifier, which we are going to be looking into like bumping up as time goes on. So I really like this combination on the uh, on the barbarian, and it also has an extra bonus. The extra bonus is that when a person enters your uh, threatened radius, you can make an opportunity attack on them. This is different from when they leave your threatened area, which is the normal rule. If you are able to push someone out of your threatened area, and that person is, you know, maybe you're pushing them out so that you are between the party and them, and they have to come back in towards you in order to re-enter that combat, you are able to make that opportunity attack against them and be much more consistently getting those opportunity attacks off um, against your enemies. More attacks, doing them recklessly, adding on more damage is more better for our Viking Barbarian. Speaking of more attacks, fifth level we are going to get extra attack. So now we're making two attacks with our attack action, one with our bonus action, probably one with our reaction almost every time. So we are dealing lots and lots of damage now, attacking all over the place um, as a frenzied Berserker Barbarian. As a side note, the 5th edition version gave, the frenzy basically gave you that bonus action attack for free, um, you know, better than a d4 damage die, which is great, but look how closely we've approximated those benefits without the exhaustion mechanic. Um, we're really in that zone and then just adding on those d6s of damage. Uh, to compensate for the low damage dice. I think this is kind of working exactly like you would want a Berserker to work. Our sixth level Path of the Berserker feature is Mindless Rage, which essentially means we have immunity to the charmed and frightened condition while we are raging. I think thematically this is critical to get on the build. Famously, the Berserkers for Vikings were completely fearless. When they flew into a rage, they were known to shrug off all kinds of damage, take on all kinds of odds. Um, these were the guys who would charge in, roaring into battle against, you know, a hundred times their number. And, you know, with arrows sticking out of them, they'd just be so excited to fight that they wouldn't stop. And I think being able to avoid being charmed or frightened and just continue fighting away is one, going to help us maintain our frenzy, which we is important. Two, just so thematic for the class. And I think whatever character you build, having this sort of like inability to be frightened while raging um, be part of their character would be such a good you know, cornerstone of roleplay. I am going to start taking us out of Barbarian now. The seventh level Barbarian feature is a very good feature. Um, it says, Feral Instinct, your instincts are so honed you have advantage on initiative rolls and dexterity saving throws. That's a very good feature. If you want to prioritize it, um, I think that that's completely fine. But um, there's something else. If I just gave you 10 levels of Berserker Barbarian, I feel like I wouldn't be doing my job as one, a content creator, two, kind of a D&D &D expert here. So I am going to make this build a little bit more exciting uh, with uh, a multi-class. But if you are shooting straight Barbarian, that's fine. If you want to do my multi-class, but prioritize this level 7 feature, everything is still going to work. Uh, we're going to end up with a strength ASI at the end of the build. Um, but you can totally do the, the Feral Instinct. I think it's a great feature. Definitely worth looking into. I just want to prioritize having more fun features at my disposal. Where am I going with this build? Well... Our Barbarian is a melee powerhouse. They are dealing tons of damage, attacking three times a turn, usually their reaction as well, um, piling on those d6s from their rage bonus, 
um, and adding additional right, uh, rage uh, damage to each attack, which is fantastic. Where I want to go from here is I want to lean into this idea of them as seafaring warriors. These are people of the ocean, of the sea, and to a certain extent they get their power from the deep fog that hides them from, uh, from prying eyes so they can make their ambush attacks. And they get their power from the frozen wastes, um, you know, making, pursuing them uh, into the north impossible for other armies. Um, they thrive in this strange environment that is, that is so hostile to people ordinarily. And so we are going to be pursuing the path of nature, the path of the druid, as we continue to gain a greater affinity with the ocean for our character. Now, there is some indication that based on the feedback received, Wizards of the Coast is planning on reverting the subclasses back to where they used to be. So they are undoing the subclass standardization. The Druid that was released in Playtest 6 has their subclass at level 3. I suspect that that will become level 2, which will make this build even better. But, on the off chance that that is not the case and it remains level 3, I am going to make sure that we're allocating at least 3 levels in Druid for this, which is why I'm uh, stepping away from Feral Instinct. At level 1 for Druid, um, we have a new feature, Primal Order, which is going to allow you to choose between a Magician um, and a Warden. Since we are already a Barbarian and we have the proficiencies that we want to have, we can go ahead and choose Magician here to get an extra cantrip. At second level, we're getting Wild Companion or and the Wild Shape features that allow a use of your um, you know, Wild Shape essentially to use. Uh, I am. I do not particularly see this character as leaning into the shape shifting aspect. Um, I think it is distinctly possible, and there's some great, you know, Viking association with having like a raven on your shoulder to scout out the land, and that is what I think this would be most useful for. I think you use wild companion and you send out your scout. Only here at second level, we're we're gonna have a different use for our wild shape at third level, but right here at second level, I think that having a raven buddy would be pretty cool. Some kind of ocean raven, or seagull, whatever. I'm not going to spend too long on the spell choices here. Here's one possible recommended list that is kind of thematic for the character. I think we're probably not going to be leaning on our spell casting as much in combat, so there's a fair amount of sort of out of combat spells to be more utilitarian uh, to your group. At third level, or second level, depending on what was the coast releases, we are grabbing our circle, and our circle here is of course going to be the circle of the sea. This is the new druid subclass released by wizards in this playtest packet, and we get some things that I absolutely love for a viking. Firstly, on our class spells, we are getting fog cloud, which I think is super critical, great for helping your party sneak up on the enemy um, unnoticed, and this was critical to the viking battle tactic. Real Vikings waited for fog or storms or nightfall to attack villages so that they weren't seen until they were already right up against them um, and people had no time to prepare. That is a critical part of what made them so successful. And getting a, the ability to call fog to, to cover your entrance to a battle is so, so cool. We're also going to get Gust of Wind, which would be useful for sailing and as well for some battlefield control if you decide to do so. As you know, while you're raging, you cannot concentrate on a spell, so it's probably not something that I would do a lot. We're also going to get things like Ray of Frost, Shatter, and Thunder Wave, which are great damage spells. Um, if you get knocked out of your rage for some reason, I can't imagine at this point with Mindless Rage and with your bonus action, but maybe. Or maybe you want to open up like that. Maybe you are still running up to the enemy, you want to you know, throw out a Shatter and then continue running. Totally possible. The main thing that we're getting here is our new wild shape use, which is the Wrath of the Sea. As a bonus action, we expend a wild shape and we manifest this aura of ocean spray around ourselves. It lasts for 10 minutes, and at the end of each of our turns, we can choose someone we see within 10 feet of us, and that target must succeed on a constitution save against our spell save DC, which admittedly isn't super high, and if they fail, they're pushed 15 feet away, which is a huge range. And then also, we deal damage equal to a number of D6s equal to our Wisdom modifier of um, Thunder damage. One thing that is important here is this ability, this is at the end of our turns, 
It does not require a bonus action. It does not require a reaction. It is free every turn. It is not a spell. We are not concentrating on it. It is all good with rage. So free extra damage and a push effect every turn. That's the, our, our three level investment is really getting us. The important part about the push mechanic is if you are at the spearhead of your group and you are fighting enemies on the front lines, you can use your pike to push people. Even if they are pushed away from you, they are still within 10 feet, which means you are able to shock them at the end of your turn and throw them 15 more feet. Now they're 25 feet away from you. They have to use their whole movement just to get back. Once they get back, you get an opportunity attack, but you are essentially throwing enemies backwards and advancing your front line. This is exactly what the Vikings were known for. When they were up against another group of fighters or defenders, they would link up shields and they would push forward, slamming the enemy with such ferocity and force that they would be driven back as the ones behind were able to raid the houses, you know, take the food and the valuables back to the ships. They were a pushing people. That was their fighting style. And so this is going to give you the ability to call on the power of the seas to continuously throw your enemies backwards um, and advance your front line one enemy at a time. Big cons here. Spell save DC is based on our wisdom modifier. Our number of thunder damage is based on our wisdom modifier. All four of our attacks during the usual thing is based on our strength modifier. So we are very multiple ability score dependent. What we're going to do to mitigate this uh, is uh, I'm going to recommend at our next level, 10th level, we are taking a boost to either strength or wisdom. You decide which one is more important to you. Again, every turn you're adding a d6 for each bump in your wisdom modifier. You've increased the chance of them failing the save by 5%, but you're dealing in, you've got an extra plus one to hit and plus one to damage for each of those four attacks you're planning to make every turn. So I think strength is probably the one that you go here. And if you continue to play this campaign to higher levels, you're probably maxing strength out and then turning to wisdom, starting to bump that up. That is the Viking, this ocean fueled master of the frozen north, someone with an incredible amount of attacks, slamming their enemies back with push blasting them back with thunder, um, and overall just having a huge DPS frontline control -y time um, with some amazing out-of-combat utility. Uh, let me know how I did on this build, guys. If you like the build and you want to play it at your table, the easiest way to do that is to subscribe to my Patreon for just $1. You get access not only to the character sheets for this build, but for all the builds I have ever done. They are downloadable on the website. I will see you guys next week with another class ranking video. Thanks guys.